So my name is Paige Tucker. I'm the CEO of the African Pro Store. We consider ourselves the world leader in the development of precision mapping solutions. The way I like to explain it is everyone's probably familiar with Google Maps. Uh, probably used it on maybe a few times even today to get to and from where we're trying to uh, trying to get to. Google Maps provides location services um, that's based on a GPF, GPS chip that's embedded in the device that's accurate to about three to five meters, which is good enough when you have line of sight, you get close to the building or the hotel or the airport, you can turn the app off and it's done its job. We've designed an app similar to Google Maps, it's our own proprietary geospatial engine, but the accuracy we provide is to the centimeter, just on a standard mobile phone, which is unprecedented accuracy. And it's specifically designed to be able to identify where utilities and pipelines are buried below the ground. So I'm going to just explain a little bit of the story of how we implement the technology, where technologies are going, particularly what I refer to as the critical infrastructure industry, which is about to go through what I refer to as a digital transformation. A lot of industries have embraced technologies over the last 15 to 20 years that have significantly improved the workflow processes and business practices of those industries. The critical infrastructure industry, which includes DOTs, are what we consider to be laggers. They actually rank number 50 in the world, which means they don't necessarily embrace new technologies, which means they're also ripe for what we call disruption. And the digital transformation is already starting this year, and I'm going to go looking through and explain and uh, show you some examples of that. So when I talk about critical uh, infrastructure, and where these innovative technologies will have the most impact. It's in various uh, industries that include construction, like I said, look here, DOT, oil and gas, engineering, surveying, railway, municipalities, mining, as well as the utility industry. Any industry that's impacted by not knowing where utilities and pipelines are located, which affects obviously the safety of projects, as well as risk associated to the environment. When we talk infrastructure, most people think about roads, bridges, highways, because of the infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which of course was uh, passed. And there was a lot of, I call, bantering going back and forth for, for a few years. Everyone's familiar with the fact that our roads, our bridges, our highways are dilapidated and in serious need of repair <coughs> and replacement. Well, to put things into perspective, there's 2.5 million miles of paved roads in the United States that crisscross the nation. That's a pretty vast network of, of roads. There's 35 million miles of buried utilities and pipelines. So our roads pales in comparison to the vast network that's buried below the ground, which is also a dilapidated and in serious need of repair and replacement. What's important about that is that these two infrastructures are connected. You can't work on one without impacting the other. So my argument is, is that when all this money starts to come down from the federal government, down to the state DOTs, and eventually down to the municipalities, if they don't know where the utilities and pipelines are, we're gonna have a significant amount of damages, which is a, again, a risk not only to the public and to the worker, but also to our environment. And we could end up having hundreds of billions of dollars worth of damages as a result of not knowing that these utilities and pipelines are buried. And it might surprise you that the utility and the pipeline companies, who you would think would know where their assets are, have no idea where the utilities and pipelines are buried. In fact, this is what it looks like if I remove the pavement in any major city in the United States. This is New York, but obviously Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, anywhere where I remove the pavement, this is what it's going to look like. I refer to it as a spaghetti bowl of utilities and pipelines that have been haphazardly thrown into the ground over the past hundred years. In fact, the majority of our utility and pipeline network was put into the ground between 50 to 100 years ago, well before we had any level of compliance or regulation or oversight. No one was really concerned about where these utilities and pipelines were being placed into the ground, and they were never intended to support this level of population growth that this country has experienced. 500,000 times a year, and these are the ones that are reported, we hit a utility or pipeline during construction. That equates to every minute of every working day, we hit a utility or pipeline during construction. And you hit a utility or pipeline, some bad things can happen. We've probably seen it. You have serious flooding, 
You can have businesses that are disrupted because there's no internet. You can have dangerous petroleum products that are seeping into our water systems, including our lakes and our rivers and the oceans. Or if you hit a high pressure gas line, there's a high probability you're gonna have an explosion. And when you do, there's serious injury that's incurred by the worker, the public, or you could have loss of life. In fact, the loss of life number is going up every year to the point where it's actually unacceptable. We spend $10 billion a year trying to identify where these utilities and pipelines are buried, and yet it's estimated, based on a DIRT report from 2019, that we have $30 billion <clears throat> worth of damages annually. A recent report said it's north of $62 billion. So just in the last few years, it's gone up significantly. <clears throat> Part of the problem is, and this might surprise you, that in the last 50 years, when we do have regulation and oversight and compliance, the way that we actually map the location of where utilities and pipelines are located, even today, is on paper maps. These are called as-built drawings. These are the original planning and design drawings on how these utilities and pipelines were designed to go in the ground. And yet, how you originally designed for them or planned for them to go in the ground or how they actually go into the ground are two different case scenarios for good reasons. The ground conditions could be too harsh. There could be obstacles in the way or where they have permission to place the utilities are already over congested with existing utilities. So they might just move them over three or four meters or sometimes on the other side of the road. Then they bury them, they pave over top of them. Regulators come in, take a look at it. As long as it's close enough, it's good enough. And they sign off on these as-built trunks, which means they become the system of record. So they're inaccurate by nature. Another problem, which is a well-entrenched business practice that's been in the industry for over 30 years, is the way that we actually locate where utilities and pipelines are. Every state has an 811 center. Call before you dig. By law, you have to call into the center and notify them where you're going to be doing construction that's going to require digging activities. As best they can, they take all the information that was provided to them by the utility and pipeline companies, if there is any information, and try and identify who's going to be impacted by that construction. Then they notify the utility or pipeline company they have to come out and mark where their utilities are. They send out these contract locators that use what's called an electromagnetic cable and pipe locating device, which the majority of the time will locate where your utility or pipeline is located. The problem is they use a spray paint can to draw on the ground where that utility is. And that's supposed to indicate to the contractor or the construction crews that's where the utility is located. Number one, because a human error at best is accurate to one meter. I also don't know if they had mistaken a fiber optic line for a power line, which can happen quite often, or if they located a utility at all. Because the fact of the matter is they get paid to put paint marks on the ground. Those paint marks can last up to six months or even to a year. We know it's common practice to just paint over the old paint mark and move on to the next project. The construction companies, the engineering surveying firms, the excavators that take on all the liability, including even um, some of the companies that we have in here, they don't trust these paint marks. What they'll do is, in some cases, they'll bring in what's called a hydrobag truck. Hydrobag truck is designed to drill a hole in the ground over top of that paint mark, suck all the dirt out through that giant vacuum system in an attempt to verify and validate if that paint mark was correct by actually exposing the utility or the pipeline. If they don't find it, they'll move it over a couple feet and they'll drill another hole in the ground. They'll continue to do it until they expose where that utility or pipeline is. Why? Because the liability of hitting a major petroleum pipeline or a fiber optic line or a high pressure gas line is far too risky. The problem with this process is an onerous process, very time consuming, very expensive, not to mention that it damages the pavement. We're on projects, say for example, with Kiwa that I'll get into, where they'll drill, drill 50 or 60,000 of these holes on a project at a cost of anywhere between a thousand to two thousand dollars per hole but this is what they have to do in addition to that another problem with the industry is a well-entrenched business practice on how they manage the data through their workflow processes so for example they'll locate where the utility or pipeline is put a paint mark on the ground or they'll bring in the hydro back to try to drill a hole in the ground to expose it then they send an engineering and surveying crew out to actually survey in the paint marks or that hole in the ground. Then they export the data onto a PC where somebody out in the field has to review that data, qualify it, then it gets exported back into the office into their system of record, which is either a CAD system or a GIS system. Once the data is finally qualified, then they can send it back out into the field so the field crews can use that information to more make a more intelligent business decision. We've been told that at best, on average, this takes about 
10 days. So by the time they get the data, they've already moved on on the project and they're making business decisions without having good data. Now, you would think with all the technology that is actually has been embraced by other industries to significantly improve their workflow processes and business practices, that the critical infrastructure construction industry would adopt technology. But as I mentioned, they're a laggard, tank number 15 in the world, which also means, as I mentioned, they're ripe for disruption. So what we did, and we are known as the pioneer and the leader, we developed a simple mobile app that works on any standard mobile device, either smartphone, like the one you have within arm's reach or in your back pocket or your purse or a tablet. You download our app and we significantly improve those workflow processes. We streamline a lot of the business practices and we even create automation. I'm just going to show you how we do that. So number one, what Coinman is designed to do is to precisely capture, record, and display where the utility or pipeline is located. As I mentioned, we significantly improve and enhance the current workflow processes and business practices. And today, our clients include Fortune 500 companies, DOTs, and some of the largest subsurface utility engineering firms in the world. So on our system, simple. You capture the data, we send it up to the cloud, and it's available to whoever needs it in the office or in the field in less than two seconds. And I'm gonna show you how we do that because it's actually pretty easy. So we take that electromagnetic cable and pipe locating device, and through Bluetooth technology, we just pair it to a standard mobile device running our point man app, and we pair it to a precision GPS receiver. So this isn't the chip, as I mentioned, that's embedded in the device. The one I'm showing you here, that's a Trimble DA2, it's about the size of a hockey puck, and that will provide centimeter accuracy. So once the data is collected on the mobile device, it goes up to our cloud, we run it through proprietary algorithms, and in the matter, as I mentioned, in less than two seconds, we make the information available to whoever needs it in the field, or in the office. This is what it looks like. So we've got the Trimble DA2, in this case, that is paired to a RD8100, which is the locate device. When they're locating where the utility or pipeline is, instead of putting a paint mark on the ground, we're digitally capturing where that utility or pipeline is located on the mobile device. And then we're capturing critical metadata that's available both from the receiver and from the locate device that, the, that provides the, what we call the quality level, which is the confidence level and the accuracy of the data that's being collected. So what type of locate device are you using? What's the currency and frequency of the utility? How deep is it in the ground? If you see on here, we scroll down, it didn't tell you that the accuracy is about 1.3 centimeters. How do we know that? Because they what's called the name string, which is the accuracy data that's provided from each satellite. That's what we're running through on proprietary algorithms to determine how accurate that information is and the quality levels. In addition to that, we can also stream out their existing records, which normally come from as-built drawings, to indicate where the utility is according to their existing records and in comparison to where it's actually being located at a click of a button, we can measure the uh, discrepancy of the distance. And all of this can be viewed in real time in the office by either an engineer or a surveyor or the data manager, meaning you don't have to send them out into the field. They can just determine the quality levels of this data from sitting in, in the office. And I'll get into a little bit what that means because there's actually been some recent changes by the American Society for Civil Engineers in their standards and guidelines that's based on our software. In addition to that, when you actually hydro back or you drill a hole in the ground, the best thing you can possibly do is put a pole on it running our software with the GPS receiver and capture that data. That's the highest level of data that you can capture, which is called quality level A. And again, I'll get into it in the new standards and guidelines. But the key is, is that because you're actually exposing where that utility or pipeline is, it's obviously very important that you capture that information because most of their records, as I mentioned, aren't accurate and then they can update their records. In addition to that, most cases, there's information that is required for gathering data. A lot of it's, again, paper-based. So you've got engineers and surveyors out there, data collectors that are writing on pieces of paper and doing sketches. Sometimes it can even just be on a napkin. We take all of the forms that they have and we digitize them. So in this case, we're integrating into A11 because the mobile device, even if you're not using a precision GPS receiver, knows where your location is. You can go into the uh, point man app, open up a form, and it'll auto-populate it because it's gathering the information from the point call ticket. So you don't have to, I call it fat thumb, and make any mistakes. Again, of course, it creates efficiencies. We've also built in the ability to take photos which are embedded 
into the forms and also do a digital sketch. So you're not doing anything on paper. All of this is geo-referenced and associated to whatever points you're collecting. And again, all of this can be viewed from the office. So you don't have to send an engineer or a surveyor out there to determine the quality levels. All of this can be done from the office based on the information that's being provided. And this is what has influenced the changes by the American Society for Civil Engineers. So historically, what you could do, you'd have to go out, as I mentioned, locate, then you could send a surveyor out there and you'd survey the paint marks, and that was considered to be very high quality, and that survey um, quality grade data. That's been thrown out. What they want is disinformation. They want to know the geospatial value, they want to know the methods that was used to collect the data, they want photos, and they also want digital sketch to determine what's called quality level A and quality level B. So this is an example. So in the last time that the American Society for Civil Engineers came up with guidelines and standards was in 2002. There was, so it's called 7502 and 3802. The new guidelines are 3822 and 7522. They came out in July of last year. And in order to get what's called quality level A or quality level B, what they require is the data that Point Man provides. Now, do you have to use Point Man? No, but we certainly influence the development of these new guidelines and standards. The big project that we did, the first project we did, was um, about a five billion dollar project that was a public and private partnership between Kiwit, which is the largest infrastructure construction company in North America, and the Colorado Department of Transportation. It was about a 15 mile stretch of I-17, which is the busiest interstate in the United States and the section through Denver that they were doing the construction on is the busiest section the busiest interstate. They were actually relocating sections of the interstate and relocating subdivisions. There were thousands of utilities and pipelines that had to be located. That's where we first tested our system. Normally they would have anywhere between uh, 10 to 20 million dollars just on damages on hitting utilities and pipelines. We reduced the we reduced the strikes on utilities by almost 100 percent. As a result of that, Kiwit has adopted our software and moved it into multiple divisions, not just infrastructure, but also light rail, water, and power. And then the Colorado Department of Transportation actually mandated the point man software, meaning every utility company, construction company, engineering surveying firm, municipality, utility owner, anyone that either owns, operates, or is managing and maintaining utilities and pipelines on a state right away is required by law to use our software and it's created a significant amount of efficiencies in the workflow processes, business practices, and also affect safety for the public and the environment. Last week I was out talking to Caltrans, it looks like they're going to move in the same uh, direction. We'll be with KCI at the end of this month, talking to New York uh, City. So other states are looking to adopt exactly what Colorado has done. Not meaning they're going to have to go with point man. It just goes to show where things are going as far as innovations utilizing technology. We also work very closely with three of the largest subsurface utility engineering firms around the world. One of them is KCI, which gentlemen in the back of the room right now, we partnered with them. They helped us influence the development of the software to make sure that we meet all of the standards for subsurface utility engineering. We also work with T2, which is one of the largest out of Canada, and utility mapping is one of the largest out of Australia. Our, Australia is definitely leading the way as far as adoption of what's called subsurface utility engineering business practices. As a result of that, we've now moved into multiple verticals like the ones I was showing you before. So we're working with municipalities, we're working with mining companies, large uh, energy companies. These are what I call the early adopters that are influencing the market. That's why I say the digital transformation is here. We've also partnered with the leading equipment manufacturers, including Trimble, which is one of the largest uh, providers of geospatial equipment, including engineering and surveying equipment, as well as the GPS receivers, and also radio detection, which is one of the leaders of the electromagnetic cable and pipe locating devices. And as a result of that, we've partnered with almost all of the major providers around the world of GPS equipment and the locating devices, including Leica, who we just recently uh, partnered with. And now we're moving into GPR as well, which of course is ground penetrating radar. So it's basically three ways of identifying where utilities are buried in the ground. You either use electromagnetic locating device, you use hydro vacuum, or you use ground penetrating radar. And that covers basically about 95% of all the methods for locating where utilities and pipelines are. 
And that is my presentation. And I think uh, Bruce is going to go next, and then we'll sit down and answer any uh, any questions you have. But uh, thank you. Okay.